thank you so much. That's really great. It's, it's fantastic to be with you um, here tonight. It's a really a great joy and honor. Um, so I think how I thought we could spend the, uh, the evening tonight is that I will um, tell you a little bit more about um, myself and why I'm, I'm here in Birmingham um, at, at the Queen's Foundation. And then um, we will look at learning and what learning might mean to us as disciples and what caring has to do with this. Is it, is it something standalone that, that is on its own or if, if it is linked with each other? And uh, in the second part, we'll um, have a look at two passages of scripture and see how Jesus teaches and what, uh, what, what teaching styles he might, might uh, uh, employ. And then finally, you will have the ref uh, time and, and opportunity to reflect in small groups. Um, but I would like to encourage you to put questions, if you have them, or comments in the chat. Um, I have to say, I'm notoriously bad to notice the chat questions. So if Ali or Tony could please uh, I will. shout. I will. <laughs> um, yeah, but please feel free to, to say um, if, you, if you have a question or if you want to say something. Um, so, first of all, what, what, what am I doing and, and who am I and why am I here? Um, so that, that happened quite surprisingly. Um, I was stationed as a deacon in North Cumbria. And then one day I got a phone call um, from the Methodist order because they needed to replace some a, a colleague who moved on from here at the Queen's Foundation as a tutor. And they asked me if I were prepared to go. And you know, it's one of those phone calls you get where you might get asked, but in fact, it is the start and the beginning of the direct stationing process. And you have to have a very, very good reason not to go. Um, and I not only didn't have a good reason not to go, but I was actually very excited about this pros uh, the prospect of going to Birmingham. Um, because, you know, I, I personally, I like learning. I had a very positive experience when I trained for ministry. Um, and I even had the idea in, in the back of my mind that before I retire in, in 20 or so years, what it was, um, I would possibly be able to, to teach something or to go, go into ministerial teaching a little bit. But I never expected this phone call. So it was great, but there was one little drawback, and that is that I haven't got a clue about teaching. Or back then, I didn't have experience about teaching. I just appreciated it, you know, but I have never been a teacher before. But with, you know, with some courses and the help of colleagues and the trust in God who uh, equips us when needed, um, I'm now happily teaching mission and evangelism, pastoral theology and leadership and social justice. But you might ask how this can be ministry. After all, I, I've, I went into ministry to be a deacon, not a teacher. Um, and well, most of my days start between eight and nine in the morning and I spend them in the office. Uh, much to my surprise, tutorials and report writing and admin and all these things, they take much, much more time than the actual teaching, standing in front of people. Uh, and Despite the fact that we lead worship and we attend chapel here um, at, at Queen's, we have our own chapel. At times I felt like I was out of ministry. You know, I was now a teacher, I was not a minister anymore. And in Cumbria, when I was in Cumbria, um, my, my activities, my ministry felt much more like proper ministry, you know, toddler groups, messy church, baptisms, worship, pastoral care, and all this. I felt like in Cumbria, I was in the thick of it. And here, it felt at times like employment. But over time, the sense of being in ministry when teaching and when encouraging learning grew in me because the ministry of pastoral care for two Ts is maybe the clearest element of this, but teaching and even planning of how and what to teach feels now like proper ministry because everything is underpinned by prayer and everything is geared towards shaping and forming new ministers. And learning is of course, not only the conveying of unknown facts, but especially training 
for ministry involves the whole person, you know, brain, heart, soul, body. And teaching and forming student ministers means that we connect with them uh, on, on, on a spiritual level as well. And the better I know my tutees, the more I plan my teaching in a way that, that speaks to a diverse range of students, the more I think I minister in a real and proper sense. So, but apart from this feel-good factor that I get at Queen's here, yeah, what has learning to do with discipleship and most importantly with this Lent course, you might ask? I think quite a lot. Um, and maybe it's an old hat for you and, and I'm not telling you anything new, but it's, I think it's still worth mentioning that the word disciple actually means student. By the way, just the same as Talib uh, means student, hence the Taliban, the students of uh, Islamic studies. And Jesus spent vast parts of his ministry teaching, even when he was healing or sleeping in a boat and being woken up by his disciples, he often used these occasions to fit in a life lesson for his students. So when we say we are disciples of Christ, we are saying that we learn from Christ, we are students of Christ. And we are on an ongoing course from which we won't graduate, at least not in this life. We, are, we keep learning, lifelong learning. I don't know how your school experience was, but mine was not as inspiring as it could have been. You know, teaching was done from the front, and if you didn't understand or comprehend something, you would get marked down. After all, it was your fault for not getting it and never the teachers. At university, students would sit in huge lecture theatres and the professor, and it was always a professor, never anybody less qualified, the professor would read from their book and make wild scribbles on the board and, and you know, would expect the students to pick up these nuggets of wisdom. And thankfully, much has changed in teaching and learning since. And you could argue some of it has changed a little too far. Uh, now it seems often that the teacher whose sheer incompetence hinders someone from being absolutely brilliant. Um, and I suspect, you know, the truth is somewhere in the middle. But of course, learning doesn't always and exclusively happen in school setting settings or in official settings. It happens whenever we experience something and when we adjust our thinking or our acting accordingly. Sometimes this learning is much more practical and relates to our daily life and some of it we never forget once we've had this experience. And I think the best learning happens when you know why you are learning, when it is important to you and your life, and when it appeals to you at different levels. The more senses are involved, the deeper the learning will be. And one of these examples, I don't know about you, but can you still remember the smell of your kindergarten or of your primary school? You know, smells, the brain remembers on different levels. It's not just the information that goes in that's getting taught like a funnel, but these impressions we never forget. When we can hear and see and smell, feel and taste something, we are much less likely to forget about it. So as Methodists, we are called to learn about our faith and how to live as Christians. And I would argue that most of this learning will be learning by doing, learning by experimenting. But of course, Christianity is also a book-based faith. The Bible is scripture, you need to read it. So academic learning is, in my view, equally important 
to experiential learning. Learning through movements of your hand, through muscle memory, as you do when you learn a manual skill, is equally important to learning by thinking and reflecting. I'm really passionate about this because I think we sometimes uh, undervalue and underestimate the value of, of practical learning. So this is what we are called to do as Methodists, to learn about our faith, to experiment and to experience faith and ongoing development by following Christ with others. So what does care have to do with this? Because this is another aspect of the Methodist way of life, it's caring and care. And of course, this is a standalone theme, you know, caring for others, pastoral care, looking after others. But just for tonight, I would like to link it with learning. So I'm coming through the back door and around the corner, bear with me. So if you have teaching experience in your working life, you will know how debilitating fear and lack of self-confidence can be. Although through fear and submission, we are able to learn certain things. We are able to learn in a drill-like manner. But fear inhibits our ability to reflect, to be creative and to uh, explore new ground. And there are many reasons for fear and anxiety, but generally, I think we can safely say that fear is better carried in a caring community if it has to be there or if it occurs at all in a community. So in order to be able to learn free of fear, we should learn in a supportive community where we, where we are appreciated for who we are and what we bring. And I think a church community can and should be such a positive learning environment. In a church community, there is no space for unhealthy competition, for you know, showing off our accolades and for the metaphorical hoarding and sitting on of uh, hoarding off and sitting on knowledge. What I know, I, I don't share with others. There is no space for this in a church, I would think. So caring for others also means caring for their learning, for their development in whatever form that might happen. It, care, it, it means caring for their knowledge and for what we can learn from them, even and especially if this learning happens in a non-conventional, non-academic, non-book-based way. Caring for others' development means helping them and us in developing as disciples. Now, Methodists have always been keen on learning in a caring environment. You just have to look at the Sunday school movement to see how important the education of working class children was to the church. And of course, nowadays, most of us learn how to read and write in, uh, in general education. And this is rightly so um, part of, of, of the state. The state is responsible for this. But there is much more learning to do outside of the regular curriculum, which I feel is a gap the church could and should fill. Because when I think, when we think about learning and caring as disciples for other disciples, we might often think that, you know, reading the Bible together and telling them the Bible stories, it all, it is all that there is to teach and all that there is to do. But discipleship is so much more than this. So for example, learning about money and finance could be something, and that might surprise you, but I argue that, and I feel quite strong about this, in my view is that not only youngsters, 
but the wider society is being taught how to consume. We are being educated in how to be good consumers. So as church, we could teach how to be, how to be good stewards of money, of gifts, of talents. And that could be quite, not maybe world changing, but it could change the society from grassroots up. We could also educate on work-life balance. You know, people are used to keeping themselves busy. But what about just being and caring for others and for ourselves? And especially the latter, the caring for ourselves. That might be for some, and I include clergy there, that might be for some the greatest and most difficult learning point. You know, many of us have this Protestant work ethic and, and we tend to live for our work. But outside of church, people feel like they are part of a rat race. And I think a lot of people have changed or tried to change their work-life balance uh, during the pandemic. But I, I feel that things have gone back to normal pretty quickly and people pick up the pieces where they left them. And all these good ideas about working less or working in a more mindful way and appreciating time off, time with the family, that I think has gone and has fallen by the wayside again. So I think we need to rediscover the idea of Sabbath. We have to gain enough self-confidence to claim free time to ourselves and not be tempted to fill every minute with entertainment, housework, meetings, or other things that we think we must do. Self-care is not an indulgent part of our way of life. It is not a modern fad, but an expression of our faith. And it is deeply rooted in scripture. This kind of self-care is something that we seem to need to relearn and to teach. Caring for others means to care also for their Sabbath time. So you see how, in my view, good teaching, good learning, good discipleship is very strongly linked with caring, caring for others and for caring for ourselves. I'm going to look at two samples of uh, examples of scripture now, um, which touch at some of these aspects that I've just said. And the first one is from Luke chapter six, verses 17 to 26. It's the teaching of the Beatitudes. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are, are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, 
for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophet. Now there is quite a lot in this passage, but just notice how Luke describes Jesus' actions as a teacher. Jesus teaches on a level playing field, so to speak. He teaches to a diverse crowd. They are from all over. And Jesus is in the midst of his listeners, and he, he is very approachable, so approachable that people touch him. It must have been mayhem, this teaching situation, classroom management, I wonder. <laughs> but anyway, Jesus combines teaching with practical healing, and that attracts large crowds. He doesn't separate the intellect from the soul or the body from the spirit. It is one. And you know what I find absolutely remarkable is that at a time when only a few people could read and write or visited something like a school, they were confident enough to think that they would comprehend what this teacher had to say. They were interested in learning. And they thought this teaching is for them, not for some, like some people say, you know, the pointy heads, the, the people who, who do the, the learning, it's not me. But these people, they thought this teaching was for them. And I think this is often overlooked, but I think this is something we should celebrate. The readiness of learning in the disciples and in the crowds, in the wider uh, uh, masses of people, uh, who were attracted to, uh, to Jesus. And Jesus' teaching isn't easy. I mean, when you, when you read this passage, it's, it's hard stuff. But he sets out what a new kingdom community might look like. And he doesn't hold back. He doesn't teach elementary level. But... As with all his teaching, he delivers it multi-layered. You can peel back the layers, just like with the, with the parables. You can peel back and go deeper and deeper and learn more and more and more. And Jesus certainly doesn't infantilize his listeners. Um, even though, you know, when we read the Bible, it sometimes might, might sound like it when he calls people children or so, but he, he delivers really, really difficult stuff, difficult sayings. And the people are ready to learn. And they expect to keep learning. And this is, I think, such a good example for us as Methodists when we want to embrace this way of life. Ongoing learning, ongoing peeling back, and the readiness to learn more is just wonderful. I have another passage, and this is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. So listen to it with, you know, teaching and caring. Yes. The apostles gathered, gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have the chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? 
How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. Now this passage is, incre is an incredibly rich source, I find, for reflection on, you know, leadership style, learning styles, teaching and caring. It's, it's really, when you go back, it's every, every corner of it has something to say about. So I will only touch on a few points here. But again, notice how approachable Jesus is. He sits down with his disciples, with his students, he listens to them, and he takes seriously what the disciples tell him. You know, they, they told him all they've done and, and they've talked. And so together, in a group, in a caring community, they reflect on what they have learned. But then Jesus demonstrates wonderful care within this teaching and learning environment. Although there are huge crowds, and Jesus could have either got very annoyed or could have easily used these crowds to further his kind of, you know, celebrity status, could have exploited this situation. He remembers that his students hadn't had time to eat and they need some rest. So they go and retreat to a quiet place. Now, that's, again, something I find quite remarkable. You know, when you are in church and your church has organized something and it's really successful, would you then go and say to your fellow congregation members or to the stewards, well, you know, I think you should go and rest. It's very challenging because we get a buzz from this, from this success. And I think it would have been very easy to carry on. But Jesus remembers how tired his students are and he encourages them to rest. So they go and retreat to a quiet place. Their Sabbath moment has come. But Jesus is not clinging so rigidly to his ideas and his plans that he couldn't change them when he sees the large crowd running ahead of them before they can land the boat, they are already there. And he thinks, well, we have to get them something. They have to eat as well. And the disciples being very practical, economical, and a little less caring than Jesus, they suggest to send the people uh, into the surrounding villages to get something to eat, to buy this for themselves. And here comes Jesus' wonderful lesson on do it yourself. And if you come from an educational background, I see some Montessori there. Help, it, help me to do it myself. You give them something to eat, he says. You do it, even though you might not feel equipped. And that for me is discipleship, going to where you are needed, going to where you are called to, and God will equip us. And Jesus ignores the worries of the disciples that it might be too costly. You know, the disciples are still measuring everything in worldly terms. And so Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Learning by doing in action. Learning by caring for others and learning by trusting in kingdom <coughs> values go and see you know this is for me is the moment when the disciples are being healed of their worldly narrow-mindedness and their hearts are opened to the love and care of the kingdom and I think this kind of teaching learning and caring is so important for us not only as individuals but also as a as a whole church especially now as we as we slowly get out of this pandemic Go and see, and then we know how the story finishes. There is enough. Don't measure the world in worldly terms, but imagine it in kingdom colors. And that takes courage, for sure. It takes courage and it takes confidence in our learning, confidence in our care for each other. 
and it needs us to be open-minded disciples, ready to learn, ready to listen, and ready to be told, go and see. So I'd like to invite you, if we can do, if, if there are no questions, or if you have direct questions now, um, otherwise we can go in small groups, I think, can't we? I have some questions for the groups. If Shall I put them in the chat? Yeah? Just let me see if I can do that. Yes, if you put them into the chat, and then we will copy them into the uh, other chat. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want to read them out? And then yes. We'll... So I would like you to, in, in your small groups, to reflect on how you see yourself as a student of Christ and what you do about it. You know, it's, it's good to say I'm, I'm a disciple. That's fine. But, you know, go and see. What do you do about your discipleship? Go here on this course tonight that's <laughs> how do you teach other potential disciples not only people in the church but outside of the church how do you get involved in this do you get involved in this and how do you or how are you planning to care for your own and others learning you might not be able to to answer them all or, but you know have a have a reflection on this and think about how okay. we can share your learning. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Mel. I'm going to pause the recording. Carry on recording and over to Mel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I hope you had a good time, a good chat. Mm -hmm. oh, no, so very um, good. Quite abrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think we can, could have 10 minutes or so of, of you know, questions and answers, hopefully answers of, of uh, different groups. But if you have something to share, um, I think because we are on two screens, if you could click reactions on the bottom of your screen and then click on raise hand, then we can see who, who would like to say something or just wave frantically and, and, and we have a look. Um, but how, how did you get a chance to, to discuss these questions? What, what did you come up with? What do you like to share? Don't be shy. <laughs> Don't forget your need to come off mute if you want to say something. Oh yes, please do. Yeah, I'm all. We had a we had a lovely discussion in our group. Um, everything from Silda um, sharing with us about all the preaching and teaching she does, and work with uh, groups in her community, and how that. Uh, she considers in doing all of that she's still learning and uh, still growing and um and very much caring as well mm. uh, as she is involved with um so her extensive uh, life and then we have uh, belinda who has been a very fervent evangelist and um and a friendship uh, discipling of people in Hong Kong. And we welcomed her. She's only been in London six weeks and very much uh, wanting to uh, keep learning from, in God here and also, uh, again, care for people, especially people from Hong Kong that she meets in London. And... Um, and myself, uh, uh, being a, a nurse background and um, working in management too, uh, we have lifelong learning policy uh, with uh, health services. And uh, again, since I've been back in the UK, I've been learning all about the pandemic and equipping myself uh, in order that I can help if I want to and also sharing how I'm working with a, um, a young uh, a couple of uh, well, a, a couple of 
young um, men, and we're all learning together uh, for our first um, production of a musical. Oh. And so that's been quite exciting and learning and God together and getting the pers different perspectives of young and old and caring at the same time. And we have a lovely meeting structure every mm -hmm. week on Zoom where first of all, we check out how everyone is mm -hmm. and share our stories from the week. And then, um, then we do have more business and organizational elements. And then at the end, uh, one of us prays mm -hmm. to close the meeting and um, prays for all of us and mm -hmm. just covers our week in prayer. So, and we we all pray for each other during the week as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. It's really rich. I mean, you know, all the examples of learning you've you've just mentioned there, and and the mutual learning, the learning through um, doing a project together, like the musical, and learning from each other across age groups, and so on. Wonderful, absolutely brilliant. Learning from each other in small groups very Methodist, obviously, you know, the, the small prayer groups, the small bands where we can learn from each other and learn from each other's experience and teach each other as well. I find, I, I don't know, it might be my, my foreign, my German background, but teaching sounds to me so official. You know, I have to be a qualified teacher with 10 years experience, but we teach all the time. You know, you teach your children, you teach each other. Brilliant, thank you so much. Richard has raised his hand. Where's Richard? There's Richard. I'm over here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was, somebody asked me to, to, to talk about what we discussed in our group, so I'll, I'll do my best, although I'm not sure that it's very accurate, but I'll do my best. Um, I think we spent most of our time talking about the first question um, yeah. because um, we, we felt that this whole idea of learning and confidence and teaching and confidence was so important. Mm. And the, the general feeling was that it was the lack of confidence uh, which held, held us back. Mm. Um, and we talked about what, how, how one gains confidence. And uh, we talked about the, um, the, the words of Jesus when he, saw the crowds and took pity on them and said they were like a a, a, a flock of sheep without mm -hmm. a shepherd yeah and and that for us seemed to be the way churches sometimes that we're like a flock of sheep but we were a bit shepherdless and, mm -hmm. and we were talking about how we can step forward as being the shepherd mm -hmm. and um in yeah. You know, we talked about small groups and, and the usual things, but yeah. um, I think we felt that we lacked the confidence to do that. And, uh, um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Thank you so much, Richard. That's really interesting. And I wonder, what kind of confidence are you lacking? Are you lacking confidence in your teaching ability? Are you lacking in confidence in the subject you are teaching? Or you know that it's worth reflecting on it because I sometimes think. Um, and I see this, you know, when we teach evangelism, even, even ministerial students say evangelism is something I really don't like because I don't know all the answers. <laughs> we say, well, that's good. Um, so <laughs> um, I think we, we expect that in order to teach and in order to teach other young disciples, young Christians, or even earlier on in, 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 in the journey, people who aren't Christians yet, we have to have all the answers. And that is not the case. Actually, it turns people off. Um, and you know, to admit that we don't have all the answers, to admit that we are all on a journey, lifelong journey, lifelong learning, and um, that you can actually, as a Christian, can learn as a disciple and from Christ, from Christ in the community. Um, that is that is so important. But yeah, it it can be daunting. Yeah, absolutely, it can be daunting. But, but you know. Christ himself asks questions because mm -hmm. instead of you just giving the answers, the person that asks it how to answer is they search you, search them quietly, diligently. They yeah. give you the answer. 
yes it, absolutely absolutely yeah. Tina, yes yeah 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 but it, it takes courage i find and it takes courage yeah. to say i don't know the answer um mm -hmm. i mean i had first year students here who said um they thought by the end of their two years at queen's they would know all the answers and we had to disappoint them you know that won't be the case no and actually you might leave uh, you might leave theological education with fewer answers than you had before because <laughs> you are more open <laughs> and you're open to other yeah, people's I learning. Learning. yeah i think and, i think sorry go on richard sorry i, I was going to say we we sort of touched on that subject a little bit but um I think it, it, it was me who suggested this, but uh, I said that in my life, I found that people are very reluctant to talk about what they really believe. Yeah. And, and I certainly was like that for many years yeah. um, because I, I, I wasn't sure that what I believed was acceptable. Yeah. Um, as I've got older and I care a little bit less, um, I've become more open and, and ready to talk about God and, and what I believe. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, and <laughs> as a consequence, I've learned a huge amount because suddenly I find other people are prepared to talk about what they they believe. And very often we're not a million miles apart. Um, exactly. Sometimes we are, but <laughs> in, in that situation, I, I found it so a, a real learning. Yeah, yeah, quite. And like you said, Matilda, this this teaching by questioning and learning by asking questions that is that is so important yeah and i think it's typical methodist actually you know and i think we we have to sit with the uncertainties and 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 sit with this and and journey together and ask questions together and that's how you teach it's yeah. not about qualification it's about how you approach this and and and, and your openness to to learning mm. Mm. oh margaret um, I would like to just add a little bit about the COVID um, pandemic. I think that that has made us share far more because we've had more opportunities. People have exchanged ideas and thoughts with each other. And really, teaching is a bit formal as far as we're concerned. I think sharing and saying why you are doing what you do, mm. what your own beliefs are, it's amazing how often you get into conversation with somebody who never goes to church, but there's something in them, either from their past or whatever, that brings out an easy conversation. So I'd just like to say that teaching, I think, is a bit formal for the general church member. But if you're able to share and open up, this is something that people have found, I think, easier now after the pandemic than they did before. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are some aspects of, of the time we spent in, in lockdown and on Zoom. There, there are things we can carry on with and, and, and we can we can hold on to. Yeah. And that is one of the and I agree with you, Margaret, this teaching, or when somebody says, Oh, and then I give a teaching session. And I think, what? <laughs> it's a sharing. Yes, it's a sharing of experiences and learning together. I find it's it's much more the the teaching by example perhaps. by example like a parent uh child you know not not in the, in the order but but you you teach by example you cook together you bake together you play together that kind of teaching is 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 brilliant because it it just goes on uh, as, as part of daily life yeah yeah and preaching is teaching because um, i always prefer even one person to mm -hmm. learn something and to come up and say Thank you. Yeah. I understand. They learn yeah. something. So yeah. everyday life, you go to the supermarket yeah. and you may happen to meet someone at the till mm. and, the and the conversation. Then they say, Oh, I never know that. I say you learn something today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so absolutely. And also, um, may I add also, you can also learn and care by being yourself mm. being honest uh, with people about your feelings about your doubts and your fears and that can also speak to people because sometimes um what they are going through we are going through it too but because they know we are christian they probably think we are some sort of superheroes 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Super kindly, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and that's where I would say, you know, this is the Christian learning as well, the discipleship mm-hmm. that we share, not only the glittering Christian career we might have had and, and the fantastic conversion experience, which you might have had, and that's great. Mm-hmm. But where have you found God in the last week? Where was God yesterday? Mm. Or when did you feel that, you know, things didn't quite work out? This authenticity that we say, the honesty can be, that, that's so important. And that's when we learn together and, and yeah, educate each other. But sometimes people find it very difficult to bring God into the conversation. And mm-hmm. I wonder, for you as an evangelist, how do we equip the church to be able to share, oh. just to bring God in conversation? Yeah. Well, that would be another evening or another nine week <laughs> module. Yeah, yes, but in general, very, very briefly, I think in general, be authentic and instead of talking at people, talk about your experience and listen. I think that's much more important than whatever we might have in store, what we want to get out to people and how we want to do this. Listen to them and then reflect together, reflect and learn together. That's for me is, is the best way do it but yeah and be brave you know Richard what you said be be courageous be courageous we will be equipped you will be equipped for the role and for your discipleship brilliant I think Jesus said that you can't do it when they said we haven't got enough loaves (laughs) he said go and get it and they went wrong and they get enough and as he prayed we had extra left (laughs) Yes. Just a just a, a a question for for Canley, or one that I found useful anyway, is mm. uh, when you get into a discussion with somebody who says that they don't believe in God, uh, I always ask them, "Who is this God that you don't believe in?" Yeah. Mm. Uh, atheism <laughs> is a religion. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, before we solve the problem of atheism or the gifts of atheism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me tonight. It was really good and an honor, honor to be with you. Tony, you're rounding it off for us. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mel, for being with us this evening and for sharing and inspiring our conversation. I know that the conversations will go on uh, if it's uh, with ourselves, a conversation in the head or perhaps with uh, people in our household. But thank you so much for giving of your time and for preparing uh, for this evening. I'm going to close. I started with um, a prayer of St. Patrick and I just thought I'd close with another one as we uh, first of all just bring our thoughts and our reflections before the Lord and offer them to him and pray that we may be guided to teach and to care as he did and a prayer of St Patrick may the strength of God pilot us may the wisdom of God instruct us May the hand of God protect us. May the word of God direct us. Be always ours, this day and forevermore. Amen.